Blomini says accusations of corruption against the judiciary are exaggerated, but vows to deal decisively with all corrupt judicial officials as he is grilled by appointments committee. Yes, please, then you'll find it very difficult. But as for the corruption, please, I cannot sit here and say that it doesn't exist at all, but it has been exaggerated very, very. We also hear his uncompromising stance on maintaining standards in legal education. We will still insist on the standards anyway. I, as a lecturer, picked some scripts from students who had written a mock exam for me and I confronted the director of law school. Said, How did these people get into the law school? So will the minority side join in approving his nomination as he dismisses allegations that he has failed to declare his assets? We find out. This is Top Story with Evans Mensah. And Top Story is always brought to you by Bond Savings and Loans. Your success, our passion, also brought to you by Gasem Cement, the nation builder, and Vodafone. The future is exciting, ready. And as Remeya announced, had uncovered real corruption within the judiciary, including documented cases of corrupt judges. And today, that subject was dominant as a new Chief Justice nominee was vetted. Justice Anini Yebwa was clear that the allegations of corruption against judges are exaggerated. He claimed that often accusers fail to come forward with evidence listen i will not say that there is not uh, there's no corruption in the, in the judiciary but corruption corruption comes in many forms i i have been at the bar for about 38 years and i can catalog series of uh, some of these cases but if anybody lodges a complaint at the chief justice secretariat and the complaint borders on corruption we invite the judge or the magistrate or whoever to, I mean, respond to the complaint. He is taking through the motions and the due process. If it, it comes out that there is evidence of corruption, some of them are dismissed. But then Ghanaians, as we are, if the complaint is lodged and you invite them, if I was handling a case from Tema and they were not even prepared to come. And please, in Ghana too, because of that perception, everybody who comes to the court to lose a case thinks that the other side probably paid money. But that is a, a, a misconception in its entirety. Nobody is taking, if, you, if, if justice emanates from you, nobody is taking it away from you because it's a constitutional provision. But if you are also not helping the judiciary to grow and getting rid of the recalcitrant magistrates and whatever, Yes, please, then you'll find it very difficult. But as for the corruption, please, I cannot sit here and say that it doesn't exist at all. But it has been exaggerated. Very, very. So I'm, I can tell you so many examples of people who are victims of uh, some of this uh, perception of corruption. I've been at the bar for 38 years. I can make some several examples to satisfy you. But we will not certainly spare anybody who is caught with evidence. But Ghanaians must also be bold and prepared to come and, I mean, prove some allegations. And that's Justice Enin Yeboa there. I want to bring in now the co-chair of the Citizen Movement Against Corruption, Adam Senanu. Mr. Senanu, thank you for your time here on Top Story. Thank you, too. Do you agree when the nominee says the accusations, uh, allegations of corruption within the judiciary is exaggerated? No, I don't. Um, and I think it's very important that people don't confuse the much said, uh, it is just a perception. I mean, perception based indexes which are used in research these days are scientific methodologies which are known to give accurate predictability. It's being used in finance and insurance elsewhere. Uh, sometimes I think that people are not well educated on the research methodology. So if you have an Afrobarometer, or any other report that says that corruption is high, and uh, on riding on the back of uh, Anasis uh, Expose, I think that we need to take these things much more seriously. But he has a point when he says, for example, doesn't he, that these are often left at the point of allegations. When you challenge the people to come forward with it, they fail to come forward, and that makes it very difficult to prove these allegations. 
If you remember the very recent Afrobarometer report, um, I moderated the launch. It, it indicates that 61% of Ghanaians said they were not willing to report acts of corruption because they feared for themselves. One, they didn't believe that uh, any action would be taken, and they fear, fear that they'll be targeted. It's a key finding in the most recent Afrobarometer report. That's a good enough explanation. What, what, what happens at the end of the day, um, and we've had recent cases where people who were supposed to be as, uh, were, um, 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 witnesses taking advantage of the witness protection system uh, to report cases uh, eventually got threatened by those who had been reported. So I don't think that the fact that people are not forthcoming with further evidence is in itself uh, a basis or justification to say, therefore, the reported corruption is, is, is exaggerated. That's not a, a very, very good way of analyzing it. Now, I want to play you his answer on judges accepting gifts. Listen to what he said when he was asked that question. Judges, once you become a judge, you should not take a gift from anybody in excess of a certain amount of uh, money. Uh, please, we live in a very small community Kofi knows Ama, Ama knows Kofi and the rest. And look at the, how we all went to boarding schools and the rest. We know so many people. While sitting here, I know so many people. If at Christmas and you come and give me a hamper, the hamper can be more than about, say, 500 Ghana cities. Please, let's face realities. We are Ghanaians. Would that amount to maybe influencing me so that when you have a case there, I will certainly bend the rules. No, please, we, we are Ghanaians first. Yes, so please, let, when we are advocating for this, we, we must call for a national dialogue to, to arrive at a consensus. Yes. Will those Ghanaian gifts include a goat, sheep, cow? <laughs> acceptable or unacceptable? No, honorable. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I know honorable member very well. If he gives me a goat, I will take it. Oh yes, I know. I know honourable member Inusa Fuseni very well. If he gives me a, a goat, yes, he as a lawyer knows that that goat is not going to influence me. I will take it because he's my friend. That will be the gift in the cultural sense. Mr. Senator, your reaction to that? Well, we're treading on dangerous ground. Um, there's a public officer's code of conduct bill, um, and it. It's, it, it, one of the things it says is about the fact that uh, one should not put yourself in a position where there is the risk of a potential conflict of interest. And to that extent, it, it states that, I mean, gifts beyond a certain amount um, should be reported, categorized, etc. I, I, I think that, I mean, one cannot construe the mind of a criminal or anyone who has intentions. I can come and visit you at Christmas knowing that at Easter, I have an agenda, and then give you a very fat whatever it is. I mean, I'm going to start some, some business, or I have some issue which is going to come up, and I'm going to have to try and lean on you. Um, the issues of conflict of interest arise in this particular response, and we do this, you say the standard is even taking yourself out of a situation of potential conflict of interest. Um, I think that the nominee may want to advise himself on that position. I don't think that he should be in a hurry to say because of culture or because of friendship, um, we should be accepting any form of gift. I think that that is treading in dangerous waters. Uh, Mr. Senator, I'm grateful that you join us uh, with those thoughts. Uh, also, ahead of today, the major controversy, the two major controversies, one that was resolved by building consensus about when to vet him, but the second one had to do with a petition that went before the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice Charge with an allegation that the nominee had not declared his assets and it's a violation of the Constitution. That today uh, was interrogated quite fiercely by some members of the Appointments Committee. One of them is a minority chief whip, Muntaka Mubarak, who joins us on the telephone line right now. Mr. Mubarak, thank you for your time here on, uh, on Top Story. Yeah, good evening to you and your listeners. Um, for the benefits of those who missed out on the vetting, I want to play a, a brief clip of yourself and the CJ uh, on this particular subject of the asset declaration. When I was appointed the Supreme Court judge, the then Chief Justice George Wood 
asked every Supreme Court judge to declare it, and I did. And before coming here to, I did. So when you say before coming here, when was this? No, last week I, I filed it at the um, Auditor General's uh, office. So I want to find out from the nominee whether he's aware of Article 2861 and 5 of the Constitution that requires that people like you and I will do this every four years. It has not been very easy for judges to com comply with this because you see, if it comes to performance of, of our duties, even uh, submitting our tax returns and everything should be done by the Secretariat of the of the of the uh, account section of the judiciary so when we were appointed it was the chief justice who instructed them to finish us with this you are so much involved with not even the administrative side of the of, of, of the uh, of the of, of you are but my lord the, I, I, but I i want to I, I would certainly Oscar. One, one moment please is insisting that or he's suggesting that as a superior court judge you must declare your asset every four years is that the interpretation of the law are you agreeing to that interpretation in the first place my lord why do you disagree with that interpretation uh, please let's look at um, 286c please nowhere nowhere it is clearly stated if you go want to go by whatever you are insisting because 286 should be read as a whole if you read c it says at the end of his term of office please i am still serving in the judiciary my term has not come to an end but on as as uh, on being appointed as a supreme court as a justice of the superior court i did yes i Lord, submitted it uh, mr chairman i want to find out from the nominee whether he's aware of act 550 that parliament passed to give details of how those assets and what it should contain are you aware of act, act 550 please the constitution takes precedent of whatever act was passed here and received presidential assent the the constitution is making it clear that when you declare on assumption of office you declare when you are going out at the end of his term of office I am still a serving judicial officer. I'm still a serving judicial officer. Uh, Mr. Mutaka, are you satisfied that the nominee has indeed declared his, declared his assets and it's not in violation of the Constitution? Well, uh, like I said, I, I, no, not at all. Because, you see, even I was a bit worried the answers that came from the Chief Justice nominee. I mean, I mean, if something, for whatever reason, you've not been able to declare I mean, that should be enough, but to try to say that even the Act 550 is in, he believes is inconsistent with the Constitution. I don't know whether you have a Constitution with you. 2861B. You know, he went and read, he read uh, C. <laughs> the B and C are very close to each other. In the Constitution itself, the B clearly states at the end of every four years, where it says that a person, maybe let me read the whole for your benefit of your listeners, a person who holds a public office mentioned in clause 5 of this article shall submit to the Attorney General a written declaration of all property or assets owned by or liabilities owned by him, whether directly or indirectly, A, within three months after coming into force of this constitution or before taking office, as the case may be, B, at the end of every four years and see at the end of this uh, at the end of his term of office Even this is abundantly very clear and if you go to five and like i told like i said i mean well he admitted at the veteran that when he became the high court judge he didn't declare his assets also when he became the uh, appeals court judge whilst he was a, a, an appeals court that he didn't declare his assets and then he also said that he thought that he was so busy to be able to do this every four years. Unfortunately, all the categories of persons that this constitution in Article 2865 
listed as the president, I mean the vice president, the speaker, the deputy speakers, members of parliament, ministers of state and deputies, chief justice of the Superior Court of Adjudicator, Chairman of Regional Tribunal and the Commissioners for Human Rights and Disability, and all and all and went on up to directors of state corporation. Believe me, Evans, everyone is very busy. Yet the constitution says we should declare. So but you see the talent that we have, I mean I have said this a number of times, I mean sitting on the Virgin Committee. If you go to the act, I believe that the act that we promulgated to support this uh, in my view, needs to be really look at. But when you when you refuse or when you fail to uh, comply with the asset declaration, I mean, if you look at the provisions, you have to be reported to the commissioner for charge, and either when you admit it, like he admitted at the high court and at post court, and also was Supreme Court judge for over ten years, he has done it only uh, once or less last week when maybe uh, he was preparing to come here. If you look, at the press, I mean, clearly a lot of violation has happened. But once you, even when the person admits, the act, if you look at this section eight, talks about the commissioner for human rights who then determine the kind of uh, punishment yeah. he can met out. And the sad thing, the very worrying thing, in the case of the uh, the, uh, the, church, the commissioner, he's supposed to be reported to the chief justice. And we are having a chief justice who is, by the grace of God, will soon take office. With this, I, I don't know if someone goes to let a complain about this other declaration to him about the Commission of uh, Human Rights and Administrative Justice. I don't know what he's going to do. Mm. I believe that we needed to take a more elaborate form of the panel because even as I sit on appointments committee and people come and go and you just see people are just not declaring the assets. And it's worrying. As 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 it is that we don't need to know the content, but people declaring it is very very important, and I believe that this is something that, as a, a chief justice nominee, I'm sorry to say, cannot just wish away. Yeah, I mean, but uh, but but from what I understand, the the parliament rises tonight, and the president is on standby to sway him in in anticipation that the house will approve the committee's report and get, and get him passed. Well, the committee is working on the report, and uh, we are all here in Parliament. If we are able to finish, I mean, which is uh, the wish of the uh, the government and all of us, if we are able to finish, then we will take it on the floor. And I believe on the floor all these issues will come uh, for the House to take a decision. But, but he but disagrees uh, with you that he's, he's not properly filed his assets. He's clear that he's done it. Uh, before the CJ has asked him to do it and he's done it last week he did it again and that he, your interpretation is not, it's not the one that, it, that even thing. though I'm not a judge he is but I want to believe that anybody with the greatest of respect takes their constitution knows that he has contravened the constitution in several forms but, 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 but this is a law that not doing it not mm -hmm. doing it at high court judge was I mean <laughs> I mean it was a uh, a contravention of the constitution and then them doing it at the appeals court judge and not repeating it uh, four years after i mean and the supreme court not repeating after four years all of them believe me based on the constitution itself because i've read the constitutional provision that in the constitution itself talks about the every four years unless it's going to mean the every four years means something else i mean they they give interpretation of the constitution but i can tell that there's no way that Every four years, that is even stated in the constitution itself in two eight six one B. Just a, just a question. Um, yeah, just a yeah. question on the principle. Have you filed your own assets according to the law? Yes, I mean each time I do that, I come with my 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 receipt so that in case anybody says, "Well, you are asking me where is yours," then I can show it. I have done that continuously. Is it your I position mean, that if you four years. if you haven't done it, it should disqualify you from holding public office? Well, the challenge is that because the Act 550 has not stipulated that if somebody fails to uh, declare his asset, that person cannot hold an office, or the Constitution itself has not said that, it puts I mean, us in a very difficult situation. Even though, I must say, if you look at the provision that says uh, people, uh, the caliber of person that should be at the Supreme Court, in my view, the, uh, the wording of the Constitution is said that they are supposed to be I mean, to the notch, 
mm. not like me or somebody who wants to be a minister or somebody who wants to be a commissioner of a uh, child or electoral commission or so. I mean, for Supreme Court, the constitution puts additional responsibility of even up to talk about the moral attitude and all that. So for me, I think that as a matter of principle, this is something that uh, they need to pick up and try to deal with. You this know, a number of things that came. I mean, I know you may not have time, and I don't know your your this. And there was this other one about using their time to do other things. And for example, he is spending time to work for FIFA. I mean, a private organization. Yet he says the chief justice gives him permission. If you look at the constitution, the case of a member of parliament, we set a committee. You go through it for them to be thoroughly investigated to be sure that it is not going to. I mean, conflict with the work that you are yeah. doing. The work that you are doing. In their case, he says, just uh, the chief justice gives permission. And sometimes, he, as he said it there, that the FIFA work sometimes takes up to five weeks. So you take public time of up to five weeks and go to work for a private organization like FIFA or CAF, and it's okay. I, I, I strongly think that these are areas that as a country we need to look at. Mm. And I'm happy that if he goes as a chief justice, I've been I've gone through this better and all these issues that came up, they will put in mechanism to regulate this thing properly because I just don't believe that, I mean, my conscience deeply, deeply is telling me that that can be right, yeah. that we have our justices who are sitting at the very highest uh, level can afford to take some of their so, time. Fi- fi- right, very, very finally, uh, do you expect uh, his approval tonight before Parliament rises? Well, I mean, because I, I don't control the chamber. Yes, I mean, uh, I mean, the leadership, it is a wish. As to what will happen, if I can tell you now that this will definitely happen, I may be... Uh, but but the report is the certainly company. coming tonight for debate. It is the hope. It is the hope hmm. of leadership that the committee reports will come before the floor tonight. And we are waiting to see whether uh, that is possible. I'm grateful that you joined me, uh, Muntaka Mubarak is the Minority Chief Whip. Now, also today, the heated subject of what to do with legal education also came up, dominating a lot of the questions that was asked him, what he will do about that contested subject that led to demonstrations recently with the alleged police brutality. Well, it turns out that the out the outgoing Chief Justice was not wrong when she indicated that uh, the incoming one who was just vetted today has a very uncompromising strong stance on the subject as well, almost aligning to what her own position was on the issue. She said she is a far more a stickler than she was. Listen to his answer to what he will do with legal education when it comes to standards. And allowing more students to pass and get into the uh, Ghana School of Law. Indeed, uh, before I even became a member of the General Legal Council, the General Legal Council mandated uh, me to lead a team comprising the uh, the Bar Association President, uh, one Mr. Kofi Abuchi, who has taught law for about 20 years and uh, uh, somebody from NAB and all that to just assess the faculties from where we will pick them to do the professional law course. Because the foundation for legal uh, professional law course is laid at the faculties. And an uh, honorable member, we have compiled our records. And if you claim me, I will publish, I will cause to be published the results that we found the result that we found and it is horrific and for the first time i've been a lawyer for 38 years now for the first time in the history of legal education you will see a law faculty headed by an acting dean who has never read law and it is in ghana all over the world this is happening in ghana you see so it is very dangerous you go to the library and you will see that well in the whole of Ghana, you have only one law librarian. But you go to the library, and at the faculty level, you see more professional law books than the, the basic ones like Smith and Hogan, uh, Street on Thoughts, and whatever. We went to a, a visit a, a, a university library, and there were 10 of Mr. Kwame Tete's books. Honorable, you, you, you agree with me. What does the LLB student need 
for a civil procedure. It, is, it doesn't happen anywhere in the world, but it is happening in Ghana here. So please, 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 General Legal Council is putting in measures to address this problem. Please, and bear, bear with me, nobody is prepared to block the entry into the legal profession. Just as uh, when we were called to the bar, we have Justice Apalu and uh, Mr. Kom and others who gave us the opportunity to become lawyers. It will be a very, very serious indictment from God. If we sit here and say that we don't want some lawyers to join the, the, the bar, when there are so many lawyers needed in various administrative and even in the judiciary, yes, we are not taking any step to block anybody, but we must be very, very careful. If you claim me, I am going to insist that the General Legal Council goes ahead to publish for the consumption of Ghanaians what is going on in the faculties. And please, you will stop. You will not raise this question. See, we are working together with the uh, the uh, IEC, the Independent Examination Committee, to to see how, in collaborating with them, we can come out with a more flexible way and see that at least the number will increase. But we will still insist on the standards anyway, because I I am I as a lecturer pick some scripts from students who had written a mock exam for me and i confronted the director of law school he's right here uh, and i confronted see how did these people get into the law school you see so please as for the standards let's try and maintain it it's only this year because Ghanaians have performed creditably outside the jurisdiction yes and we, we have to be very careful not to certainly rush and take a decision it's only this year that the abysmal performance occurred So that is the Chief Justice there on, on that subject. Um, and let's speak to Mr. Jonathan Aloha, uh, who joins us on the telephone line right now. Um, he is the uh, President of the National Association of Law Students. Hello, Jonathan. Hello, everyone. This is Jonathan. I'm the President of the National Association of Law Students. Thank you, sir. Um, so you, we listened to, the, we listen to the, um, the nominee there. Uh, do you find in him an ally for the campaign that you've been on for some time now? Yes, I've, I've said this before and I'll say it again that the point of acceleration for a lot of law students, particularly those of us in the campus school of law, is the fact that um, the Chief Justice nominee has vast experience teaching the law at the professional level and so he understands the system. It comes to the table with a certain, a certain level of understanding and um, I think that after all you said and done, after all that was said at the veteran today, I still have come away from my interview with a flint, uh, you know, a flicker of hope that he is first and determined to turn the value of the in the direction that we are all seeking by the Thank you very much. Uh, that is the uh, SS president for the Ghana Law School there, Jonathan Aloha, there speaking to us. Of course, he says he finds himself, he finds in him somebody who is prepared to uh help address the challenges what's your own view on what you've heard so far about the cj nominee send me a whatsapp 0244340437 this is a new snipe coming up shortly ndc communications officer drax attorney general and inspector general of the of police to a high court over attempts to investigate him for an alleged cyber crime offense stay with us